Hello and very warm welcome to the brand new edition of Parliament this week, your weekly roundup of all important developments in Parliament. I'm Kriti Mishra and now let's begin the show. And first, let's talk about the ensuing monsoon session of Parliament. Rajya Sabha Chairman M. Venkaya Naidu on Friday held a detailed discussion on various options for conducting the proceedings of Rajya Sabha during the ensuing monsoon session of Parliament. A broad position that emerged was to enable seating of members of Rajya Sabha in the chamber and galleries of the house in conformity with the norm of physical distancing and to enable virtual participation of other members from either the central hall or the Bal Yogi Auditorium in the Parliament House premises. The chamber and the galleries of Rajya Sabha can accommodate 127 members while adhering to the physical distancing norm. Take a look at this report. Rajya Sabha Chairman M. Venkaya Naidu on Friday held a detailed discussions with the Secretary General and senior Rajya Sabha Secretariat officials on holding the monsoon session of the Rajya Sabha. Various options were considered on conducting the proceedings. They included allowing only a limited virtual participation at present in view of the capacity constraints of the NIC. Chairman Naidu reiterated that capacities will need to be upscaled in due course for a larger virtual parliament. He suggested that the effort should be to enable participation of the members in the proceedings from within the house to the extent possible. The chamber and the galleries of Rajya Sabha can accommodate 127 members while adhering to the physical distancing norm. All galleries except the media gallery will be used for seating the members. Seating of the media persons in the media gallery would also be in conformity with the physical distancing for which guidelines would be evolved. For enabling viewing of members from outside the chamber of the house, it was felt that screens would be needed both within and outside the chamber of the house as required. Given the limited seating capacity of 127 members in the chamber and the galleries of the house, Chairman Naidu directed officials to draw up appropriate plans to seat members based on the strength of various parties in the house or any other effective criteria, like preparing a list of members for the day who will participate in the proceedings of the house. Issues pertaining to question are voting in the House if required, administrating oath or affirmation to the newly elected members, detailed planning for transportation of members, effective measures for physical distancing and sanitization were also discussed. The chairman also directed officials to submit a detailed action plan for consideration by early next week. Friday's review was aimed at enabling the Rajya Sabha Secretariat to be in a position to execute the best possible option of holding the proceedings and take necessary action whenever the government decides to hold the monsoon session as per constitutional provisions. This is Kriti Mishra's report for Rajya Sabha TV. And moving on now, the amendments in the Indian Stamp Act 1899, brought through Finance Act 2019 and rules made thereunder came into effect from 1st of July. In order to facilitate ease of doing business and to bring in uniformity of the stamp duty on securities across states and thereby build a pan-India securities market, the central government, after due deliberations and consultations with the states through requisite amendments in the Indian Stamp Act 1899 and rules made thereunder, has created the legal and institutional mechanism to enable states to collect stamp duty on securities market instruments at one place by one agency. A mechanism for appropriately sharing the stamp duty with relevant state governments has also been developed, which is based on the state of domicile of the buyer. The present system of collection of stamp duty on securities market transactions led to multiple rates for the same instrument, resulting in disputes and multiple incidents of duty, thereby raising the transaction costs in the securities market and hurting capital formation. Let's take a look at some of the salient features. The stamp duty on sale, transfer and issue of securities shall be collected on behalf of the state government by the collecting agents who then shall transfer the collected stamp duty in the account of concerned state government. In order to prevent multiple incidents of taxation, no stamp duty shall be collected by the state on any secondary record of transaction associated with the transaction on which the depository or stock exchange has been authorized to collect the stamp duty. In the extent scenario, stamp duty was payable 
by both seller and buyer, whereas in the new system, it is levied only on one side, payable either by the buyer or by the seller, but not by both, except in case of certain instrument of exchange where the stamp duty shall be borne by both parties in equal proportion. The collecting agents shall be the stock exchanges or authorized clearing corporations and depositors. And moving on now, Vice President of India and Chairman of Rajya Sabha, M. Venkai Naidu, has called for bridging the digital divide to achieve universal primary education and to ensure equitable secondary and higher education. Stressing the need to make technology accessible and affordable, Vice President Naidu pointed out that there were many children who did not have access to digital devices. Take a look. The education of the 21st century is very different from the Gurukula days and how education was delivered in Takshasila and Nalanda at that time. The education sector has been transforming rapidly in the last few decades. We have seen unprecedented expansion of opportunities. There has been a digital explosion and knowledge revolution. And it's an ongoing evolution that has to be fostered further. More children are in schools and universities than earlier. The skills required for a changing world have been evolving continuously. In the midst of this transformation, we now have to face the challenging context of pandemic. This is forcing each one of us to seek new ways of doing what we have been doing for a number of years. To survive in this new world, education institutions are going digital. VP Naidu also said that a large number of students were impacted due to the lockdown as they find it hard to study online. Many of them need hand-holding to shift from offline to online and require proper training to pursue education through online modes. Stating that many parents in India still cannot afford digital devices, he said that bridging the digital divide was too big and complex for the government alone to accomplish. And the task must be undertaken by the private sector as well, especially educational technology firms, to contextualize the products at affordable prices as per the needs of the learners. They are communicating, sharing, working and completing projects. Examinations are also being conducted online. New technologies are being used for that purpose. We can clearly foresee that in the years to come, artificial intelligence, virtual reality and augmented reality will transform the classrooms. This will also transform the way teachers teach and students learn. These changes will make it necessary to have a reorientation of the teacher training. That is very essential. The teacher will have to learn new skills of delivering learning online. The students would have to learn new skills. They have to be self-learners and collaborative learners. Technology offers immense opportunities. One can now carry a lot of books in smartphone. There are a number of audios and videos available online. These learning resources compress time and space and make learning much more convenient and interesting. Would it not be wonderful if sitting in a remote village in India, an aspiring scholar can access a book in the library at Harvard. With online laboratories, students can access machines anytime from anywhere and can practice before getting into a real lab. The teacher now plays the role of a facilitator, a guide, a counselor, and a coach, and very often that of a friend to the student. As the book mentions, the role of teacher will change from that of a sage on the stage to a guide by the side of the student. Teachers must therefore adopt their approach to learning in tune with the rapidly changing scenario. My dear brothers and sisters, technology opens up new possibilities, but also makes us realize the big digital divide in our society. 
there are many children who do not have access to digital devices. We have to realize the dream of universal quality primary education. If we have to have an equitable secondary and higher education, we will have to address the issues of this wide gap in access to technology. Technology must be accessible and affordable. This is very important. <coughs> A large number of students are impacted due to the lockdown as they find it hard to study online. Many of them need hand-holding to shift from offline to online. They require proper training to pursue education through online modes. Many parents in India still cannot afford digital devices. Bridging the digital divide is too big and complex a task for the government to accomplish on its own. That's why I call upon the private sector, especially educational technology firms to adopt and contextualize the products as per the needs of the learners and price them to make them affordable. This is your time to make a momentous contribution to nation building and securing a bright future for all our children. Bharat Net is connecting all the villages with high-speed broadband network. With this, ensuring digital connectivity has become much easier. The state governments in collaboration with private sector and the NGOs must come up with out-of-box solutions to make quality education at all levels a reality. This is a moment of disruption. The way we live, learn, earn, rest and work is changing. Let us understand the changes and adopt creatively, collectively <coughs> to the new normal. Let us prepare for and shape the future by turning adversity into an opportunity. Observing that artificial intelligence, virtual reality and augmented reality will enter classrooms more rapidly, VP Naidu said that this would transform the way teachers teach students and learn. Highlighting the importance of value-based education, VP Naidu called for developing a model of education that reflects Indian culture and ethos. Take a look. We need education for progress and development. Education is not for employment alone. Education is for enlightenment. Education is for enhancement of knowledge. Equally important is the role of education in character building. Education should be value-based and make the students not only acquire knowledge, but also wisdom. The curriculum should include various aspects of our rich cultural heritage and highlight the importance of protecting nature. That's why I always say nature, culture, together for a better future. Protect nature and preserve culture for a better future. Teachers play the most crucial role in shaping the character of a child after his or her parents. Therefore, teachers should have societal concerns. We must develop a model of education that reflects Indian culture and ethos. We need to inculcate cultural, moral, ethical, and spiritual values among children. And lastly, Vice President Naidu paid glowing tributes to former Prime Minister P. V. Narasimha Rao on his birth anniversary and recalled the pioneering role played by him in initiating economic reforms at a critical juncture when the Indian economy was on the brink of a collapse. In a Facebook post, Chairman Naidu referred to the measures initiated by Rao to liberalize the economy observing that former Prime Minister had laid the foundation for trade liberalization and the reintegration of the Indian economy with the global economy, especially East Asian economies. Chairman Naidu said that a huge credit should go to Rao for the growth of India's GDP in the subsequent years and the emergence of the country as the fastest growing economy in the recent past. Pointing out that gradually a broad consensus emerged in the country on the need to continue with the reforms, he said the former Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee accelerated the reforms while the present Prime Minister Narendra Modi is implementing the reforms with greater vigour. Observing that Rao laid a strong foundation for nuclear security as well, Vice President said, and I quote, 
Among his bold moves in foreign policy were establishing diplomatic relations with Israel and reversing decades of frosty relations between India and United States by bringing them together, unquote. Well, that's all I had for you in this edition of Parliament this week. Thanks for watching and stay tuned to Rajya Sabha Television.